Uh, hi, everyone. Emil Grastra. Uh, this talk is biohacking. Uh, so what is biohacking? Uh, really, it's uh, a term that's evolving. Uh, biohacking uh, involves technologies that are advancing at a rate that uh, allow us to 3D print organic tissues, uh, to develop protocols and uh, methods for hacking the mind and body, and uh, to even you know, decompile DNA, the, the operating system of life. Um, that's all very fascinating. I'm excited to talk about it. But really, with the time constraint, we're going to now write in on grinders. And grinders are do-it-yourself cyborgs that are upgrading their bodies with hardware uh, without waiting for corporate product development cycles or you know, authorities to say it's OK. Uh, so my story here, uh, biohacking the new kind of human evolution. And I, I really believe that. Uh, so we're going to start with my story in, uh, back in 2005. Uh, I was working with a bunch of medical uh, clinics and doctors, and uh, I was doing a fairly good job, I guess. So I became popular and started getting a, quite a large key ring uh, collected. So I had to carry this around with me everywhere, and it just became a pain. So I had an office door that locked uh, behind me every time I left, even if I had to run to the car to grab heavy server equipment. So you know, I would come back to the door and just be like, oh, and it really got me thinking about keys. So, what are keys? Keys are kind of archaic. They're hunks of metal cut in a specific way that identify you as an authorized person to go through that door. And I thought, that's, I mean, we can do better. Uh, I want the door to just know who I am and just open. Uh, so I started looking at biometric technologies like fingerprint readers, uh, iris scanners, that kind of stuff. And uh, the problem is that those technologies are a little bit bulky, a little bit clunky. Uh, at the time, they weren't very reliable, not much better today. Um, and they were really vulnerable to vandalism. So somebody could come up there and hit the sensor, mess it up, and that's a $1,000 unit that's in the trash. So I looked at you know, access cards, like RFID access cards. Those seemed like a great solution. The only problem was I don't wear things. Uh, I leave my keys and wallet, and I leave things. And so I knew that if I put one of these on there, I would just walk out the door and go, oh, as soon as I, it's shut. you know. Um, so I started looking at the, the types of implants that pets were getting. Uh, the dogs and cats go to the vet to get a chip injected in their neck. And I said, that's RFID. Maybe I can find some kind of solution. And uh, did a little research, called the company uh, that made one of these chips. And I said, that's great and all, but do you have kind of a more standardized version? And uh, they said, no. And the, pet, the whole pet industry is very proprietary. So I kind of gave up for a bit and then found, eventually found a, t a tag that was glass encased, but not really meant for implantation. So I called that company and I said, hey, what kind of glass do you use? Do you, is it biosafe? Is it the same glass that's used with the pet implants? And they said, well, yeah, but it's not, it's not meant for implantation. It's an industrial thing. I said, oh, OK, thanks. Click. Um, <laughs> so immediately <clears throat> uh, went out and grabbed a, uh, an injector kit for a pet uh, assembly. And I took the pet chip out. Uh, sterilized the tag that I had, put it in there. Um, then I went to my doctor and uh, had it injected uh, into my right hand. Um, so actually, you'll notice the doctor isn't wearing gloves, and that's an that's a actual common misnomer. It's the gloves are there to protect the practitioner from you, not the other way around. So he said, I, I'm your doctor. I know what you got. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, um, the door that I built, this is an access control system. I just hacked it together myself and uh, installed those little reader uh, on the left, there, right, your right, my left. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just used that on a daily basis, no big deal, and was happy. That's, that's all I really wanted it for, and, uh, and it worked. So um, I went through the door, and one of my friends said, oh, hey, what, what just happened there? And I kind of explained it. He took a couple pictures, and then <laughs> So. <laughs> So yeah, the, the, the blogosphere. And then, you know, keep in mind, this is 2005-ish, so it's, those logos aren't really accurate. But uh, uh, anyway, the, 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 uh, the Twitters of the day um, picked it up and, uh, you know, uh, slash dot, boing, boing, uh, and gadget. So uh, eventually, that led to traditional media. I was doing different types of interviews with radio, TV. Good Morning America came and like held hostage the apartment for 12 hours. And we got five minutes of air time for that. And uh, so anyway, it was a very interesting experience. But it led me to writing an article for uh, Spectrum magazine, and then a book called RFID Toys, which is out of print now and didn't sell very well. But it was actually pretty important, because before then, RFID was not a technology. It was really accessible to the hobby 
level of market. So people that wanted to tinker around in their, in their garages with it, it was kind of the first book that showed them how to do that. Um, so in the book, I cover things like how to take apart a, a keyboard and put a reader into it, and then you can use that to log in. Demo time. So <laughs> if the demo gods are smiling. So this is a little Windows 7 laptop. Got a reader plugged into it, and oh, there it is. <laughs> I thought, oh, gremlins. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it's very simple. Just uh, do that, logs in. And that's a do-it-yourself hacker solution. Um, so uh, beyond that, I uh, took a fire safe and modified it to add RFID technology to it. Um, it's important to, to me to, to add, to augment. Uh, so you can still use the pin code. It just also accepted RFID. Um, you can also take commercial deadbolts and modify them to work as a, as a home access solution. Uh, but today, there's a much greater and more elegant solution. Um, this is a little Samsung door lock, a little deadbolt. And I can push the button and present my tag, and it unlocks. So that's the deadbolt. Oh, thank you. So the great thing about that is that unlike trying to hack things together um, yourself, you can just buy that and pop out your deadbolt, put that in its place, and even if you're renting, there's no holes or anything, so it's great. Um, so that wasn't uh, all smooth sailing, though. It was a little bit of rough waters. Uh, we had some, some, some kickback from, <laughs> some, from some people. Um, mostly, mostly, I think, uh, um, the problems that people presented uh, were, were based on misinformation. Um, you know, you see Hollywood movies, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, being able to zone in on somebody, find, find him, and that's just not the case. Um, so there's some groups out there that, that kind of think that RFID is evil. Uh, <laughs> they really think that it's the, the mark of the beast and it's, you know, it's uh, some kind of, uh, you know, subscription to, to Satan himself. So um, I can tell you that, no, it's not the case, at least for me. Um, they also think that uh, somehow it's involved with GPS. And, you can find something right away, and it's a, no, that's, that's really not how it works. There's no battery, there's no power supply in this thing. Uh, it's powered by the reader that you bring it close to. And um, yeah, the, 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 the evidence of that is really, if you look at the, the pet chips that pets are getting, you can't find out where your cat or dog is. They have to be brought to the vet, the vet has to scan it very close proximity. So the range is a couple inches. So if you're within a couple inches of me, you could probably read it and find out where I am. <laughs> So after that, it quieted down. Things quieted down. I stopped, stopped getting uh, you know, interview requests, and the kind of the anti-chip people kind of went away. I mean, they're still there, but I didn't get like threats every day like I used to. Um, so then something amazing happened. Um, the maker revolution kind of happened. So people got interested in going back into the garage, start to tinker on stuff, start to build things. Um, this was pretty amazing, and uh, it still continues today, and it's very, it's like, it's revitalizing a lost art, in my opinion. Um, so people are forming groups, hacker groups. They're putting together things in the garages. They're forming hacker spaces. This is a hack space in Vancouver. If you don't know about it, check it out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, open source hardware. That's another thing that came on the scene. So uh, hackers that want to tinker on stuff, you can get open source, really cheap, powerful hardware. Um, this has kind of changed the game for a lot of, for a lot of people that want to explore electronics. Um, smartphones became ubiquitous. Everybody's got a supercomputer in their pocket, and that's kind of changed the game uh, and personal data collection. So people started doing crazy stuff. They wanted to interact their technology with their bodies. Um, this is a MindFlex thing. You can see some data back there being collected. Um, that kind of gave rise to the quantified self movement, which is all about collecting data about yourself to better yourself, to hack yourself to make yourself better. Um, there's a Nike Fuel Band, that's an example, and then. Uh, the Zio headband is a sleep tracker that you could wear, and it would download all your data to your phone. Um, it's no longer made, but there are people that are trying to get old ones and hack them. Um, so this kind of rise in new technology equaled you know, a lot more emails to me about RFID implants and interest in augmenting the human body. Um, so this next slide is an example of what happened. Uh, so as the emails started piling up, and I couldn't really keep up with it, I kind of let, let People just found their own resources. They started doing crazy stuff and sourcing bad materials and just kind of hacking into themselves. So if you're squeamish, look away for this next slide. Um, but uh, this is an example of what someone did, a biohacker, and uh, she cut into her hand, 
played around with it and ended up with sepsis and was in the hospital for a couple weeks. So I decided after, after these events to start a company called Dangerous Things. And the primary goal of that is to provide safe materials and safe guides on how to do this kind of stuff if you want to get an RFID implant. So we're also partnering with piercers. Uh, piercers are a lot more open to the idea of body augmentation. So where you might have a problem going to your doctor and saying, hey, I want to get this chip implanted. Um, a piercer might be like, cool. And then you can actually have a, <laughs> yeah. You can actually provide a guide to that piercer and say, uh, here's how to do it. And, and if they have any questions, they can contact me now. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of piercers signed up and people are getting uh, chipped across the globe. I mean, Russia, Australia, China, I had one guy. Um, yeah, everywhere. So we're also doing some cool development. There's a little flat tag. It's paper thin, flexible. Uh, I had it implanted into my right ring finger, and that's a piercer. I don't know if you can see the tattoos on the hand there, but that's a body mod professional, not a doctor, doing that. Um, the great thing about it is that it's NFC uh, compliant, with NFC is near field communication, and it's that smartphone link that I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to do another demo if the gods are smiling. So this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, probably not, but this is my uh, little smartphone, and I can bring my tag up to it and it loads my contact details. So the idea being, I could use this to log into, or get into my house, log into the computer, but now with NFC, I can pass my contact details to different people. Um, so uh, eventually the tag did fail and it had to come out, uh, but that's kind of the beauty of biohacking. Uh, you can experiment with some educated knowledge that is shared amongst the community. Um, you, can, you can share your ideas and make a pretty safe uh, path for exploring this stuff. Um, that's the, the idea that biohacking is a community effort. So, you know, the grinders that are doing this, this stuff to themselves, people that are working on DNA and other types of biohacking, we're all sharing information and it's very, very intriguing and it's exciting. So, the human body is kind of a, an interesting thing. A lot of people think it's a, a sacred thing and that the body is themselves, they are their body. Uh, biohackers look at it a little differently. Uh, we see the body as a sport utility vehicle for the brain. So the brain is ourselves, and uh, our body is a pretty cool, you know, adaptable, flexible, and now upgradable sport utility vehicle. Um, so we have five senses, and uh, the biohacker, you know, wonders, well, why not six or seven? So why not plant a magnet in the pad of the little finger there? So a little tiny magnet can go in there, and now that person has a sixth sense. They can actually reach out and feel magnetic fields that they couldn't feel before. So it's information about the environment that they had no way to process or even you know, take in the information. But now you can reach out and explore magnetic field. That's pretty awesome. Um, there's another device that uh, is worn on the ankle that gives you an inherent sense of direction. So this works by having buzzers around the internal band of the device that your brain will eventually learn over the course of a couple weeks to ignore the buzzing and now interpret that new data as direction. So a person can wear this, they'll get used to it, and then they'll just know north is that way. I don't even know where north is, that way? So, but that's the point. If I had one of the things, I would know it was that way. <laughs> so another, another great sensory uh, enhancement. And one day these might be implantable, or um, you know, they might not even need to be implanted at one time. Uh, like uh, homing pigeons have magneto sensors. There's cells in their beak that can actually sense uh, magnetic north, and they use that information, and we might be able to decode that, that DNA and integrate it into our biology successfully. So that's what biohacking is kind of all about. Um, this is another device that's being worked on right now by a set of grinders, and its goal right now is just to prove a proof of concept. So my tags are passive. There's no battery in them, and that's great. They can live forever and do their thing, and I'll be dust in the coffin. They'll be sitting there. Um, but this thing is going to be powered. It's going to have Bluetooth. It's going to connect to mobile phones. It's going to collect data about your body, so pulse, uh, temperature. In the future, there'll be more more and more data it can collect, and it might even uh, serve as a path to putting data back to your neural network. So it might one day interface with your neurons, and you can have data coming both ways. So it's an iterative process, and that's one of the great things about biohacking is we're not waiting for the corporate product development cycles. We're, we're doing this on our own accord. Uh, this guy had a, uh, an interesting implant put into his tragus, the, the little sticky outy parts of your ears. So magnets are in there, and he's able to wear a coil around his collar and induce the magnets to, to vibrate through the magnetic field generated by the coil. So he's able to listen to things, hear people talk, whatever, um, just by doing that. And this alone isn't very 
intriguing. You could just wear headphones, but it's intriguing that it's the next step, the iterations that this will go through that's, that's very interesting. I mean, it might one day be that you don't have a Bluetooth headset, you just have the audio implanted in your jaw or something. And the idea is that you could have your phone, you upgrade it every couple of years, but you always can talk through this system. I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing. So this project is not a grinder project. It's more of a body hack project, but it's very interesting to me. It's, it's going on right now. Um, they're trying to raise funds, but the idea is they want to shift the human visual spectrum into the near infrared. They want to do that by restricting vitamin A1 and, uh, and use vitamin A2 as part of their diet. And that their hope is that the body will start to produce a different protein that will allow them to see infrared. Um, the nice thing about it is there's, there's all kinds of, you can Google infrared photography and there's all kinds of stuff out there. But the truth is that that's a representation that's been changed so that we can actually see it. If these guys are successful, they'll be the first human beings to ever actually see infrared. And their brains might not even know what to do with the information. It might just make them, you know, they might just say, oh, I don't know what's going on. And they'll have to actually process it, and the brain's plasticity will have to kick in to understand the new data. It's very, very, very interesting. So I'm going to end the talk just uh, by saying that biohacking really is, in my opinion, the future of human evolution. Um, you know, we have a long way to go between now and thousand years from now, and, and this is going to be critical to getting there, I think. So if you're even remotely interested in biohacking, get involved, make it yourself, make it your own. <laughs>